And all those cases, he's gonna list maybe hundreds more, they involve guns that are not banned by this. I can invoke additional powers. No constitutional right, in my view. They say that when we argue for removing weapons of war from the streets of America, we're actually telling them to repeal the Second Amendment. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Breaking news. Since June of 2022, New York's arm confiscation has climbed tenfold, which is a tremendous increase over previous years, and it is set to get worse. New York is yet another state, similar to California, that just cannot seem to catch a break. Control laws passed in 2022. By 2022, there have been a number of high-profile mass incidents and a steady increase in arms-related cases across the country, which has prompted lawmakers and law police to call for tougher control regulations. The first significant piece of safety legislation passed in decades was signed into law by President Joe Biden in June. The bill does provide financing for state crisis response programs and school safety, but it does not restrict any arms. New regulations have also been established in many states, such as California, Delaware, and New York, to help reduce arm misuse. These laws regulate ghost arms and tighten background check procedures. Data gathered by the Armed Violence Archive, a nonprofit organization monitoring arm incidents nationwide, shows that 2022 will rank as the second highest year for mass incidents in the United States ever. Today and will be effective for 30 days unless it's renewed. The governor says she knows people will disagree with certain portion. And all those cases, he's going to list maybe hundreds more, they involve guns that are not banned by this. And NAGR is filing a suit in the Northern District of Texas to put a stop to their overreach. In 2022, there were at least 647 mass incidents as of December 31, 2021, became the worst year on record since the Violence Archive started documenting mass incidents in 2014, with 692 mass incidents throughout the U.S. A mass incident is one in which at least four people are put down, excluding the perpetrator. According to a research released in January by the organization Every Town for Safety, a nonprofit dedicated to preventing arm misuse, there is a strong association between states with laxer arm laws and greater incidents of armed demises, including slaying, self-harm cases, and unintentional slayings. Increased arm restriction is not universally accepted as the solution. While some Americans defend the constitutionally guaranteed right to keep and bear arms, others claim that control laws save lives and do not violate the rights of citizens. Despite the controversy, some lawmakers have continued to pass control legislation. States continue to lead on safety, passing new and innovative policies that we will work to replicate across investments in community intervention programs. Said Shannon Watts, the organization's founder, Moms Demand Action has been fighting for safety measures ever since the 2012 Sandy Hook Elementary School incident in Connecticut, which claimed the lives of 20 children and six teachers. The campaign to prevent arm incidents is stronger than ever, and this success, along with our political victories in November, paves the way for more advancement in the upcoming year, said Watts. Federal Legislation The Bipartisan Safer Communities Act was adopted by the House and Senate and was signed into law by Vice President Biden on June 25. Since the 1994 arms ban's 10-year expiration, the collection of laws constitutes the most substantial federal effort to curb arm violence. As he signed the legislation at the White House, Biden stated, God willing, it's going to save a lot of lives. The package contains $750 million to assist states with the implementation and management of crisis intervention programs, including mental health, drug, and veteran courts. These programs can be utilized to handle red flag programs as well. Extreme risk protection order rules are another name for red flag laws, which are governed by federal regulations. They provide judges the authority to take away firearms from anyone they deem to be a threat to oneself or others. The law encourages states to submit juvenile records to the National Instant Criminal Background Check System, which would enable a more thorough background check for those wishing to purchase arms between the ages of 18 and 21. Additionally, more people who sell arms as their main source of income must register as federally licensed arm dealers who must conduct background checks on potential purchasers before making a sale. Arms are prohibited from domestic offenders who are in continuing serious relationships of a romantic or intimate nature. 
However, if they haven't committed any other crimes in the last five years, the law permits those found guilty of misdemeanor domestic offenses to regain their armed privileges. California In 2021, California was named the nation's top state for safety. According to the Giffords Law Center to Prevent Armed Violence, it has the strongest system in the country for taking arms from those who are no longer permitted to own them. Five safety laws were passed by the California State Senate and were signed by the state's governor, Gavin Newsom, in July. On July 1, Newsom signed AB 1621, which further restricts ghost arms and the components required to make them, as well as AB 2571, which forbids the arm industry from promoting arm-related products to children. The right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Issued her order only to be smacked down summarily and quite hard by the courts. The bill AB 1594, which establishes a code of ethics for the firearms business in order to encourage safe and responsible arm industry member practices, was signed into law by the governor on July 12. AB 2156, which was signed on July 21 and enforces arm production by forbidding anyone, regardless of federal licensure, from producing arms without a state license, is also a part of the package. Furthermore, it forbids unlicensed individuals from using 3D printing to create any arm or arm-related component. The most recent law, SB 1327, was signed on July 22. It enables private individuals to file civil lawsuits against those who produce, transfer, import or export weapons or ghost arms, which are illegal in the state. Colorado The Vote Without Fear Act, also known as House Bill 221086, was signed on March 30 by Colorado Governor Jared Polis. It is illegal to carry an arm in plain sight inside any polling place or central counting facility. The law also prohibits open carrying while election activity is underway within 100 feet of a ballot drop box or any building in which a polling location or central count facility is located. A maximum $1,000 fine, up to 364 days in the county jail or both, may be imposed as penalties for violations. Delaware On June 30, Delaware Governor John Carney approved a package of safety laws that included measures to outlaw arms, control high-capacity mags, and bolster background checks. According to HB 450, the Delaware Lethal Arms Safety Act of 2022, with few exceptions, outlaws the manufacture, sale, offer to sell, transfer, purchase, receipt, possession, or transport of weapons inside the state of Delaware. Another piece of legislation in the package would raise the legal age to buy or own an arm from 18 to 21, outlaw the use of devices that turn handguns into fully auto arms, and hold arm manufacturers and dealers liable for reckless or negligent actions that lead to arm misuse, according to the bill. Illinois J.B. Pritzker, the governor of Illinois, signed two legislation that deal with ghost arms and secure storage of arms. The governor approved HB 4383 on May 18. It forbids the sale and ownership of ghost arms and mandates that all arms be serialized so that law enforcement may more easily track them down. Later on June 10, Pritzker signed HB 4729, which mandates the Department of Public Health to create and carry out a two-year public awareness program centered on safe arm storage, including disseminating knowledge about safe arm storage. Maryland Larry Hogan, governor of Maryland, declared on April 8 that he would permit Senate Bill 387, which prohibits the sale or possession of ghost arms, to become law without his signature, since it does not go far enough in holding violent criminals accountable, as Hogan put it. After receiving bipartisan support, the bill became law on June 1 and broadened the definition of arm to include an incomplete frame or receiver. It mandates that the Secretary of State Police maintain a system for registering firearms imprinted with serial numbers, and it prohibits a person from purchasing, receiving, selling, offering to sell, or transferring a unfinished frame or receiver or an arm unless imprinted with specified information, according to the bill. The governor must also set aside $150,000 in the state's annual budget to pay for registration proceedings, according to the statute. New Jersey Six of the seven safety laws Phil Murphy, the governor of New Jersey, signed on July 5 were part of his Safety 3.0 package, which he had presented to the State Assembly in April 2021. According to the bill, the package contains legislation that would enable the state's attorney general to bring legal action against arm industry players for infractions resulting from the marketing 
or sale of arms. The assault weapon ban does not ban handguns. I'm sad to say people are having to use guns to defend themselves. An assault weapon's only purpose is to kill people efficiently. I can invoke additional powers. No constitutional right, in my view. The package also includes laws to control the sale of handgun ammunition, create an electronic reporting system for these purchases, and mandate training before issuing an armed purchaser identity card with a 10-year validity period. Another item in the package requires arm owners who move to the state to obtain an arm purchaser identification card and register weapons bought outside the state. Murphy strengthened the state's arm licensing regulations on December 22 and established a list of sensitive places where carrying a concealed arm is not permitted, including playgrounds, alcoholic serving pubs and restaurants, railway stations, and voting locations. New York A number of laws and another piece of legislation to address a variety of safety concerns were signed into law by Governor Kathy Hochul. On June 6, Hochul signed a safety package that includes legislation requiring hand arms to have micro stamps, strengthening the state's laws governing extreme risk and arm purchases, raising the age requirement to buy semi-auto rifles to 21, and improving information sharing between local, state, and federal agencies when arms are used in crimes. Hochul signed legislation strengthening the state's laws and tightening restrictions on concealed carry after the Supreme Court's decision on June 23 to overturn a law passed in New York more than a century ago that restricts carrying a handarm outside the home. According to the legislation, the law, which goes into effect on September 1, will enlarge the eligibility requirements for concealed carry permits, limit the carrying of concealed arms in sensitive areas, and establish state oversight over background checks for arms and routine checks on license holders for criminal convictions. Oregon Measure 114, a safety ballot initiative, was approved by Oregon voters during the November 2022 U.S. midterm elections. It enhances background checks and forbids the sale and transfer of ammunition mags that may store more than 10 rounds. The legislation also plugs the Charleston loophole, which permits arm sales to proceed automatically after three days, even if a background investigation has not been finished. Before an arm is sold or transferred, state police must conduct background checks on the potential buyer. Providence, Rhode Island On June 21, Governor Daniel McKee of Rhode Island signed three laws pertaining to armed safety. They forbid the open carrying of rifles and shotguns in public, raise the legal age to purchase arms or ammunition from 18 to 21, and include exceptions for law enforcement officers. They also outlaw high-capacity mags. The definitions of rifle and shotgun in one of the measures are also modified to comply with federal law. They are coming for your guns. They're listing them out in this extensive legislation. They say that when we argue for removing weapons of war from the streets of America, we're actually telling them to repeal the Second Amendment. Vermont. On March 25, Vermont Governor Phil Scott signed legislation into effect that forbids the possession of arms in hospitals and forbids the transfer of arms between unlicensed individuals. In February, the governor vetoed S-30, a bill that would have closed the Charleston loophole. The new measure, S-4, amends the policy by extending the amount of time for the federal authorities to finish a background check before a person can buy an arm from three to seven days. According to the bill, it also enhances protections for domestic hurt victims. Washington On March 23, three safety laws were signed into law by Washington Governor Jay Inslee. HB 1630 forbids the open carrying of hand arms during school board meetings and places where elections are held, while HB 1705 prohibits the manufacturing, sale, acquisition or possession of ghost arms. High capacity mags, which are described as ammunition feeding devices with the capacity to accept more than 17 rounds of ammunition, are prohibited by the third measure, SB 5078. Michigan enacts red flag law. Legislation allowing judges to order the temporary confiscation of arms from Michigan residents deemed to pose a risk to themselves or others was signed into law by Governor Gretchen Whitmer. The Extreme Risk Protection Order Act, also known as a red flag law and already enacted by 20 other states before Michigan, is the third and final piece of a three-part set of control laws that were unveiled in the immediate wake of the incident on the campus of Michigan State University on February 13 that claimed the lives of three students and five others injured. 
The four bills Whitmer signed would enable law enforcement, medical professionals, family members, guardians, current and past romantic partners, and police to ask a judge to take away a person's arms if they are thought to be at risk of using them. Before signing the legislation, Whitmer said, With extreme risk protection orders, we have a means to step in and save lives. At a bill signing in front of the 44th District Court in Royal Oak, Democratic state leaders praised the efforts of survivors of armed tragedy, lawmakers, and lifelong campaigners for the measures they had worked so hard to get passed. On the grounds that it infringes on the right to bear arms guaranteed by the Second Amendment, law enforcement personnel who have said they won't enforce the law were likewise forewarned. Sheriff Mike Murphy of Livingston County has declared he won't enforce the new regulation. Attorney General Dana Nessel said, Let me say this loudly and clearly. For those who are in law enforcement who refuse to enforce these important orders, I will make sure that I will find someone with jurisdiction who will enforce these orders. Supporters have stated that the rules would make it easier for professionals and family members who are aware of a potential risk to identify people who might commit self-hurt or engage in other types of misuse against others. However, some have responded that they go against the Second Amendment's right to bear arms and violate due process rights. Efforts to strip citizens in New Mexico of their otherwise inalienable rights under the guise of a public health crisis. Uh, Democrats to restrict Second Amendment rights like requiring background checks for transfers of firearms. You know, she'd probably back off and take that energy and put it elsewhere, but no, no, no. There is no constitutional right to carry an assault weapon. It just doesn't exist. The Supreme Court is acknowledged. A petition for an extraordinary risk protection order may be filed, and an order may be granted under the new law with or without giving the person concerned notice. However, judges are obligated to schedule hearings within specific time frames to verify compliance or to provide the person concerned a chance to oppose the order. The laws didn't go into effect right away, so they won't be in force until the spring of 2024 or sooner, depending on when the legislature concludes its annual session. When it does go into effect, law enforcement would be expected to uphold a judge's order, Whitmer told reporters. Before running for governor in 2018, Whitmer served as the prosecutor for Ingham County. Every prosecutor has taken an oath to uphold the laws of the state of Michigan, and that's the expectation, she added. Kim Worthy, the prosecutor for Wayne Jurisdiction, noted that education on how to apply the legislation will go along with the law, at least in her jurisdiction. Judges, prosecutors, police and sheriffs are among the people Worthy wants to be sure understand what this means, what it can do, and what we can do with it. Republicans and Democrats expressed some reservations about the proposal when it passed through both chambers. The Republican minority opposed the bills largely because they believed there was a lack of due process for people who might have their arms seized. There was no psychiatric evidence required to support an order. It was possible to forum shop by filing the petition in any circuit court in Michigan, regardless of where the defendant was located, and there were general concerns about the law's violation of the Second Amendment right to bear arms. Lawmakers included language requiring a demographic analysis of the bill's applicability after several Democrats expressed concern that the law would be used to target minority neighborhoods. Although police associations have generally supported the bill, many police departments have expressed concerns about the strain it places on officers, who will primarily be responsible for upholding court orders. How the Red Flag Law Would Work A complaint made by a relative, current or former partner, law enforcement or mental health or medical professional would need to demonstrate by a preponderance of the evidence that the offender poses a considerable risk under the law approved. In the event of an emergency hearing, the standard for securing a confiscation order would be raised, requiring clear and persuasive evidence. If a judge determines that an extraordinary risk protection order is necessary, it must forbid the purchase or possession of arms and force the return of any such arms or unused purchase licenses. Worthy claimed that her county has a laundry list of instances in which crimes would have been avoided if a red flag statute had been in force at the time. She pointed out that the law might have helped to stop the slaying of three people at a Detroit gas station on May 6. After his card was refused for a $4 purchase and the clerk shut the doors when he tried to leave with the things, Samuel McRae, who has been charged in the event, is accused of claiming the lives of three people. McRae's lawyer claimed that he had serious mental illness and paranoid schizophrenia at the time 
and was on probation for an arms charge. McRae was unhappy at being stuck inside the petrol station, according to his counsel. Worthy said of the red flag statute, We don't know if the family would have benefited from it. However, given that there were obviously problems there before, at least they now have that option. Uh, your right to own a gun can also be restricted. Compared with the decade before its adoption, the federal assault ban was associated with a 25% drop in gun massacres. Enforcement officer or licensed security officer shall possess a firearm. To ensure that all emergency responders are aware that the person shouldn't be in possession of an arm, law enforcement would be required to put the order into the Law Enforcement Information Network and notify federal law enforcement. If a person is the subject of an extreme risk protection order, law enforcement must undertake a good faith effort to find out whether that person is in possession of any arms that have not been turned in. The order would need to be accompanied by hearing dates so that people may contest it and submit requests for modifications or cancellations to demonstrate that they are no longer a risk. An arrest, felony and misdemeanor charges, a finding of contempt of court, or an automatic extension of the order could follow a violation of the order. In addition, felonies are punishable by one to five years in prison. A first-time offender who knowingly and intentionally makes a false statement to the court would be charged with a misdemeanor and sentenced to 93 days in jail. What's ahead? Other legislation already passed in response to the incident at Michigan State University mandates background checks and registration for all firearm purchases, as well as secure storage of arms in homes where minors are present. This legislation was motivated by the fatal incident on November 30, 2021, at Oxford High School in Oakland County, which left four students lifeless and six others, including a teacher, injured. State officials have described the three policies as a floor rather than a ceiling, but they have been reticent to identify the laws that Michigan will implement next to regulate arms. Whitmer added, I don't think the conversation is over. Many loved ones, survivors from Oxford and MSU, are present today. I am aware that they want to talk further about what else we could possibly do to keep people safe, and we are always interested in having that discussion. Rep. Kelly Breen, a Novi Democrat and chair of the House Judiciary Committee, predicted that lawmakers will prioritize completing the work of a task group established to address school safety following the massacre at Oxford High School. According to Breen, there may be other control legislations in the works, including measures to ban ghost arms or impose waiting periods before buying arms. But the second-term member claimed that her main priority was identifying programs that have a track record of success. Breen stated, I'm not concerned about the man who is parading about with an arm merely to say, I can march around with an arm. The kids that have easy access worry me. Concerning those experiencing a mental health crisis, I'm concerned. Concerning the use of straws, I'm concerned. Expanding ERPOs in New York In recent years, New York has taken extensive measures to expand and increase the use of extreme risk protection orders, commonly known as red flag laws. The lack of due process becomes evident when the person targeted by an ERPO is unaware of the proceedings until someone arrives at their doorstep to enforce it. Furthermore, there is no due process if the individual must appear in court after their property has been confiscated to prove their innocence. Recently, Governor Kathy Hochul signed legislation aimed at further facilitating the issuance of ERPOs by eliminating associated fees. In the past, individuals seeking an ERPO had to go to court, complete an affidavit, sign it, and pay a filing fee of $210. Double down on it and work overtime to strip her citizens of their otherwise inalienable rights. They are obsessed with attacking law-abiding Americans' Second Amendment liberties. This fee deterred some people from pursuing ERPOs due to the financial burden. However, with this new legislation, all fees have been waived, removing a significant barrier to filing ERPOs. The intention behind this move is to encourage more people to initiate the ERPO process, potentially leading to an increase in confiscations. This change eliminates one of the hurdles that may have caused some to think twice before pursuing an ERPO. Now, anyone, including law enforcement, school personnel, medical professionals or others, can submit an ERPO affidavit without any financial impediments. Once the affidavit is submitted, it goes before a judge, and the targeted individual's property may be confiscated. In our humble opinion, this process lacks due process because the affected individuals are often unaware of the ERPO proceedings until it's too late. 
If the trend of increased confiscations continues, the impact on affected individuals and their rights could be significant. To illustrate the potential consequences, let's consider the numbers. If, on average, 400 people per month lose their rights due to ERPOs in New York, that's 4,000 individuals impacted every 10 months, or 4,800 people per year. Over the course of a decade, this could result in over 48,000 people having their rights restricted, and some may never regain them. This expansion of ERPOs serves as an alternative approach to control when other legislation may be deemed unconstitutional. Instead of passing laws to confiscate arms directly, they are increasing the use of ERPOs, potentially leading to a substantial erosion of individual rights. In states like New York, California, Illinois, and others, there is a relentless pursuit of increased control measures and they appear determined to employ any means necessary to achieve their objectives. That's all for this video, folks. We'll see you next time.